So, third talk of this session will be on non-malleable commitments against quantum attacks, uh, worked by Neil Bitansky, Rachel Lin, and Omri Shmueli. Who will give the talk, please? Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, hi, everyone. So, um, as said, uh, I would like to tell you about non-malleable commitments against quantum attacks. So um, the basis for this talk, let's start with commitments. So uh, a commitment scheme is a protocol between two classical polynomial time algorithms, a sender who wants to commit to a message and a receiver who gets this commitment. Um, they interact and at the end, the receiver gets this commitment. And after the interaction, uh, the sender can reveal the value and decommit to this unique value, um, sending a message and a decommitment. And the receiver can decide to accept or reject this. Uh, um, okay, in terms of security, uh, we have binding, uh, which is going to say that uh, the commitment is indeed uh, committing. Uh, specifically, statistical binding is going to say that uh, any unbounded sender that interacts with this uh, uh, efficient receiver, at the end, there is at most uh, a single message that the sender can decommit to. And um, another security property is the hiding. It's going to say that um, any uh, quantum computational hiding is going to say and that the receiver doesn't learn anything from the interaction unless the uh, the message was revealed. Uh, um, formally, we can look at the quantum view of the receiver at the end of for any pair of messages and um, the view for M1 and the view from M0, and it's going to be computationally indistinguishable. Um, okay, so this this was the, the most basic and standard definition of commitment schemes, and it doesn't protect us from one of the most uh, fundamental and basic attacks in both applied and theoretical cryptography, which is man-in-the-middle attacks. So a man-in-the-middle attack is some uh, efficient algorithm at the middle. It is going to try to disrupt this uh, conversation between the two parties and make... Um, the receiver get a commitment to a different message, even though it doesn't know what the message is on the left side because of the hiding. It is still going to be able to, to like uh, um, maul it under the commitment. Um, and accordingly, we have non malleable commitment, which are commitment scheme that are secure against this uh, uh, man in the middle attacks. Um, intuitively, not entirely formally, is that um, the message that the receiver is going to get on the right is going to be one of two extremes. It is either the, the man in the middle is transparent, which means that it doesn't do anything and the receiver gets M, or it is going to be completely independent of what happens on the left. It can just block all the messages of the sender and uh, uh, commit to some zero or something. And um, non-malleable commitments are a very like, uh, active and uh, um, field in cryptography. They have a lot of uses in other central cryptographic objects. They also have like specialized techniques for other non-malleable objects in crypto, like non-malleable codes, extractors, time lock puzzles, and, and others. So they are interesting in like they have uses and also um, special techniques that are relevant for non-malleable cryptography. And accordingly, they, these, these kind of objects were heavily studied by like tens of works. However, uh, which brings us to the, the subject of this talk, is that all of the previous transactions are not known to be secure against general quantum man-in-the-middle adversaries. Um, and we today want to talk about post-quantum non-malleability, which means that the attack in the middle is going to be by a quantum polynomial time adversary is going to, do, to try to do exactly the same. And uh, to be a bit more formal about this independency of M, yeah, um, so um, the formal definition, the almost formal definition of non-malleable commitments is that we're going to have, uh, uh, the, the, for the honest parties, it's still going to be classical. So the sender and the receiver, both classical parties, uh, they have a joint input, which is a tag. This is not a CRS or something, like one of them can just pick it. It can be the sender who picks it or the receiver who picks this tag. And at the end of this interaction, they, they have a commitment. And the man in the middle at tag game is as follows. If before the man in the middle try to like uh, change the value of the commitment under the commitment without seeing what's inside, now it is going to try to commit to the same value, but with a different tag. So it's going to gain a commitment on the left with respect to some tag 
TG that he is going to, to pick. He's going to get this commitment from the honest sender. And on the right, he's going to commit, he's going to pick a different tag, TG tilde, and going to try to commit, but to the same message. Now, it's, it's a known fact in crypto that this definition is equivalent to the before two extremes kind of definition. And um, we're going to focus on this game. Like the, the full definition is a bit more general, but this like kind of game uh, is going to capture everything we want for this talk. Okay, so the only um, um, single work on post-quantum non-malleable commitments is by uh, Agarwal, Bartuse, Goyal, Kurana, and Malavolta, which shows that if we assume the, super, the slight super polynomial hardness of LWE, we have post-quantum non-malleable commitments, but they are secure only against synchronizing adversaries. This protocol also is constant rounds. And synchronizing adversaries are like a, a very specific kind of man in the middle attack, um, which brings us to our results. Our main theorem is that if we have post-quantum epsilon extractable commitments, we're going to define them in a bit, um, with K rounds, we uh, con construct post-quantum non-malleable commitments having a number of rounds, which is K to the C for some constant C times a log star lambda, the security parameter. And if we combine this main theorem with previous work by uh, Chia Chang, Lian, and Yamakawa, uh, they show how you can construct from post-quantum one-way function constant round epsilon extractable commitment, quantum extractable commitments. And when we combine them, we get the main like corollary or main result is that if we assume post-quantum one-way functions, we have uh, post-quantum non-malleable commitments in log star rounds. Okay, so let's break down and like uh, concentrate on the like main technical um, uh, lemma for today. Um, this is our main theorem, and uh, we can forget about this uh, epsilon extractable commitments, and this is a slightly weaker um, uh, statement, which will suffice for today. And uh, this statement is broken down, like by these two lemmas we prove it. The first is the construction. Uh, we show that if we have a post-quantum extractable commitment, um, having K rounds, we can construct post-quantum non-malleable commitments also for a number of constant tags and K to the C rounds. And the other one is tag amplifications. We said that the tag can be anything, uh, any string, any lambda bit string, so we should have exponentially many tags. So the other uh, lemma is just amplifying the number of tags and having uh, a bit of a round over overhead. And this uses a bit of modification of previous work, which is why today we're going to focus on the main lemma, the construction. Okay, so let's let's get a bit of intuition of why non-malleability is like less trivial when we want to, to prove security against the quantum and in the middle. Um, um, which to understand this difficulty, let's first define extractable commitments. So this again is a commitment scheme. It's going to have one more um, very important property this is quantumly extractable, so is a polynomial time quantum extractor algorithm, such that for every arbitrary, possibly malicious sender, the extractor is going to um, simulate two things. So when the, this malicious sender interacts with the receiver, it has a view, the quantum view, and also it commits to a message. So um, the extractor is going to, um, to simulate um, side the quantum view and also the committed message, like the message under the commit. Okay. Um, so here is a very um, common approach in non-malleable cryptography. We're going to try to get from an extractable object to a non-malleable commitment. Um, so this is a successful man in the middle. It manages to commit to the same message with a different tag. And um, what we know is that if this man in the middle manages to do two things, the first is the interaction with the sender on the left, like by the book, a regular interaction. And also we can extract from the man in the middle on the right. So this is an extractable commitment. The right session, in the right session, the man in the middle is the sender. We can try to extract from the sender the message. If we can do this, essentially we can break the hiding of the extractable commitment because the sender just sent the message here M without revealing it. And we managed to extract the same message on the right 
So essentially we broke the hiding of the commitment. Um, and if we can do this, we can show non-malleability. Okay, but if we try to extract, uh, usually when we, we extract information from any circuit, we need to maybe rewind it or have non-black box access um, to this man in the middle. And when the man in the middle in the non-malleable setting, it also includes the sender on the left, we need to do these same like uh, rewinding and non-black box also for the sender which is invalid for security reduction against the hiding of the extractable commitment on the left. Why still we have non-malleable commitments in the classical setting is because in the classical setting, we don't just use ex like plain extractable commitments. We have like specialized techniques that do work in the classical settings, but we don't know actually, uh, these are some examples. We don't know how to make these specialized techniques to work in a quantum setting, like none of them, at, at least until now. Um, okay, so which brings us to the technical question that we ask today is we the only extractable cryptographic object we have in the quantum setting is um, no, is like plain extractable commitments. We're trying to build non malleable commitments from just plain extractable commitments. Okay, so let's get to the techniques. Um, we will use extractable commitments, but with one more um, uh, property, which is first message binding. First message binding just says that if this is the protocol between the sender and the receiver, the first uh, message in the protocol is from the sender to the receiver and is going to be like perfectly binding. Once in send is the, 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 the value in the entire commitment is fixed, M. And we show in the paper, this is a very easy to show that any um, standard extractable commitment can be turned to be first message binding. Okay, so let's use these um, uh, commitments. So this is the first version of the protocol. Um, the first version of the protocol, the sender is going to first um, uh, secret share the message M into N shares. Then it is going to take, to take each one of these shares and uh, give an extractable commitment to it sequentially, one after the other, U1, U2, and until UN. And uh, finally, this uh, N, which we call the block length, which is also the number of secret shares, um, we're going to pick it as a function of the tag. It is going to be K plus one to the tag, where K is the number of messages in the extractable commitment. So just to make sure everything here is constant, like uh, uh, K is constant uh, because we have a constant round protocol and also the tag because we have a constant number of tags. Um, okay, so this first version is intended to solve the first case. The first case is when um, the tag on the left is bigger than the tag on the right. Once, and, and we have like the, the number, the, the block length for left and right, and this is a successful uh, man in the middle adversary. It commits to the same message M. And what one can show, which follows from the security of the secret sharing, is that if we interact with the honest sender on the left, like we don't need to interact with it um, uh, um, in an honest manner for the entire interaction, we need to interact with it on a single share for some UI, not as before for the entire session. And also we managed to extract all of the shares on the right, we can perform the reduction. Another thing we can, we can see is that for this choice of parameters, the number of uh, shares on the left is bigger than the entire number of messages on the right. This means that if we look at this, this like uh, more like uh, in a more fine grained manner on the interaction between the men in the middle and the two sides, we always have trivial, uh, trivially at least one share which is going to be free of interleaving interaction on the right. We call such share on the left a free share. Now, um, the second thing that we use is going to be the first message binding. It means that all of the commitments that like start, the first message of them is going to be before the start of this free um, share on the left. We can just fix everything until then and then start the reduction, and then have like a non-uniform extraction because all of the messages before are fixed. Okay, and for the rest that happen after this uh, um, free share, we can just uh, use the, the online efficient extraction, extraction that we have from the fact that these are extractable commitments. 
Okay, so this only solves like the first case where the, 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 the left one is the bigger and the second one is intended to solve the full case. So what do we do uh, when we don't know who, which, which side is going to be bigger? The sender now is going to um, partition twice M, one into M share and the second one into um, N head shares. And then it's going to do kind of the same. It's going to give sequential extractable commitments to the, to the first block and then sequential extractable commitment to the second one. And we're going to pick um, the, the block lengths. The first one, the top block is going to be as before. And the uh, bottom block is going to be um, to define like this, where tau is the number of possible tags, which again is constant. Okay. So what happens now? So we show a few things in the paper. Um, we First of all, we define an ideally scheduled um, execution of a commitment of a block commitment. So let's let's like uh, just make sure that we, we know what's going on here. We have on each of the sides two block commitments, a top one and a bottom one. And um, we, we say that a commitment, a block commitment on the right is ideally scheduled if two things happen. First, we have that on the um, block commitment on the left, the top one, we have one free share. And the block commitment on the left, which the bottom one, we also have a free share with respect to the same block commitment on the right. So here is one example where like uh, this bottom uh, right block commitment is free with respect to U n minus one. It is also free and non-interleaving with respect to U hat two. We also show that um, if we have an ideally scheduled right block, which is a property of the execution, like we can say if we had an ideally scheduled block or not at the end of the execution, and um, the man in the middle essentially decides how this is going to play out. And if we have such block, we can do the reduction. Okay, some additional hurdles is that um, in the paper we show by a, like a combinatorial, uh, relatively simple argument why there is always um, an ideally scheduled block on the right. But then we also, um, as part of a deeper analysis of, of, of ensuring the security, we need to give a zero knowledge proof at the end that the two, um, the M at the top, at the end of the mod, at the bottom are the, the same message essentially, which adds a bit of uh, complexity. So we define ideally scheduled block in a bit a bit of a different way, but for the sake of this talk, we simplified it. And um, just to finish the talk with some open, with one open problem, um, the protocol that we get um, is a log star round. Um, in the classical setting, we have a constant round, non malleable commitment protocol. We actually have many. And uh, one, I think, very nice problem is post quantum non malleable commitments with constant rounds. Uh, thank you. There's time for questions. Yes, if you could use a microphone for the benefit of those who watch the recording later. Yeah, hey. Um, so I guess in, in regards to this open problem, um, is it like if you had sort of more uh, like fancier extractable commitments, would you sort of immediately get this? Or is there something else in the quantum setting that breaks down? So I think there's something else because if, if you like, um, we did get, um, constant number of tags from constant constant round. We have like, a, in terms of extractable commitments, we do have like constant round and epsilon extractable from one-way functions or not epsilon extractable from just LWE. Um, it's unclear what are these special properties that such constant round commitment should have in order for them to like compile to a full-blown um, protocol with exponentially many tags. So we don't even know what kind of property we need from the extractable commitments. I see. Yeah, we're like uh, clueless here. It, just uh, as a follow-up, the the second part of your result, the like, tag, amplification. tag amplification, is that also like uh, do you need to do something specific for the quantum setting, or is it kind of... no, not really. The, the the second part is mainly technical. We look at some classical reduction with tag amplification is something known in the in the yeah. in the non-malleable setting. 
We just make sure that the same actions actually apply to the quantum setting. The, the tongue amplification is technical, but easy. Thanks. Thanks. Are there more questions? Yes. <laughs> so, hi. So, uh, uh, great talk. But, uh, what about uh, CCA commitments? Uh, in particular, what about the CCA, non interactive CCA commitment of uh, the Kshita Kurana? Uh, is, is that something? Is there some non interactive uh, CCA commitment? Which is ah, okay. Yeah. If we looked into this? Yeah. No, not really. Yeah. yeah okay. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thanks for the great talk. Is, this, is it on? I yes. Know. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask about um, the extractable commitment schemes. So um, the order one prot protocols in the classical setting versus your protocol, um, are they all black box extractable or are, all, are they all non-black box extractable or is one the one of them? Yeah, that's 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 like you're hitting the nail on the head. So uh, some are like non-black box extractable. Some of them, if you know Barak's protocol, Barak's like zero knowledge protocol, some non-black box zero knowledge protocol, we did like make them work in the quantum setting. This specifically Barak's protocol is something that's heavily used in the non-malleable setting. And we don't know how to make it work out to, to like to show that this is post quantum secure. And this is like one non-black box example. Other examples, they just use rewinding. So there, yeah. there exist classical um, constant round non malware commitment that don't use non-black box techniques. Yes. Okay, thanks. Yes. If no one else, then thank you again. Uh, let's beat, let's beat. We are two minutes early for the break. There's a break with refreshments here. We can beat the other crowd. We will be back here at 1625.